nothing, uh, nothing quite like an authentic clap prompted by the senior pastor. <laughs> I appreciate it. Every, every, every last clap. Thank you so much. Uh, hey, good morning. How are we doing? How was, uh, how was your hurricane week? So fun. Yeah, we're enjoying the newly installed uh, water feature in our backyard. Large pond, really, really quality. We're going to add a few fish. Not true. Um, well, hey, how about, how about this for a way to start a message? How, do you ever feel like you just don't have what it takes? Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, 9 a.m. was not audible on that one. Thank you. That's good. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> like maybe it's too early to get depressing on that, but have you ever been uh, given an opportunity and you just panic? Like, hey, here you go. Uh, you got this, this chance, and you just, you just freak out. Like, I remember when I was a, a teenager, uh, I was sitting in one of these chairs, like a, a little black comfy chair in our youth room, and I was on the, the very end of the row, and the youth pastor walked up to me during the last song, and he's like, hey, John, uh, this, this song ends. You want to you wanna pray for us? And I just went, I, f- I froze. I mean, just full-on panic. I peed a little bit, not true, but... <laughs> I just like, what? Uh, and then I, just, I was like, no, I don't. I, I, think I, I think I actually said, like, I don't know. Like, that's not an answer. Um, and I just, I just absolutely panicked, and he saw the, the shock on my face, I think. And luckily, he just like, oh, it's cool, it's cool, don't worry. And he moved on, but I was so embarrassed. Like, it was a solid week to two weeks before I could look him in the eye. Like, I was avoiding him. I was just like, I didn't want to talk to God. I don't know. It's just where I was at. I just, I, I panicked. But, you know, we, we have uh, these moments in our life where we're just embarrassed of stuff. And, and I just want to talk a little bit of time this morning to talk about our vulnerability, some of our weaknesses, some of the stuff that we, we just try to hide. You know, it's exciting, right? So let's, let's talk about it. Let's do it. Um, and I don't want to harp on vulnerabilities either. So, like, I kind of want to do the opposite because the point of this is I think I think that our vulnerabilities and our weaknesses are often the things that uniquely qualify us for the opportunities that God has for our lives. So like right now, I am currently on a stage. Can you all see? Yep. I have crippling stage fright. Like this is a, this is a true thing. Like I get visible shakes before coming out on stage. Like when I'm back there, I'm sitting there like, you got this, you got this, John. Like, I, I do, I, I freak out. I have really bad stage fright. That's the reason I told that, that youth pastor no all those years ago. Because I just like, I have to talk in front of people? Are you kidding me? Like, it's a sick joke that God, you know, was like, hey, you want to do this pastor thing? Like, I, to this day, it doesn't matter. It's still a real thing. Like, and I share that because a trend I've noticed in my own life is I just, you just connect better with people when, when, I, when I'm real, Instead of putting on this like fake, ideal, perfect person all the time, when I just open up and I'm a little bit vulnerable and a little bit like, yeah, this is something that I deal with every day. It's just something that goes on in my life. All of a sudden, um, things happen. And so, uh, you know, I don't know um, if you've met someone that just like can't admit that they have something wrong with their life. Uh, it's, it's like jarring. But one of the most relatable human experiences is that we're all constantly working on stuff. Uh, over in Discover Center Point, that's happening right now in, the, in that room over there, uh, we talked through the 12 uh, values that we have here. Uh, we added one recently, but uh, two of them just, just talk directly about this. It's one of the things I love about Center Point. It's one of the things that attracted me to this church. Uh, first one is, we're a safe place for anybody struggling with anything. Like, it's just great. I love saying that. Um, that includes those who are struggling with Christianity, like it's a safe place here. Sometimes all we need is a place just to, to struggle and grow. Uh, we don't always need the, you know, someone to lay out the, the next steps for us. We just like, I just need a place that I'm safe, that I can grow and I can ask questions. And that's what we really value here. We want to we do that. But it, it acknowledges the fact that everyone's struggling. Like every one of you in this room has at least one thing that's on, on your mind right now that you're like, yeah, that's a weakness. That's an area that I need some growth in. And then the next one is we encourage progress at your own pace. Because we have to get real with our struggles. We have to get real with our vulnerabilities. But even if, even if you could just like think of every single one of them right now, but you don't have to do, no pressure, uh, make a list, your, uh, ask your wife, whatever. Um, but like if you could think of every single thing that is wrong with you right now, that doesn't mean that you could just snap your fingers and be better. 
That doesn't mean you can just snap your fingers and all of a sudden I fix all those things. It takes time. We have to be realistic about growth. And especially when the thing that I think is the next step for you to work on is like number 437 on the Spirit's list of things that he's working on in your life. And so we, we encourage uh, everyone as they're struggling uh, to, to progress at their own pace. But, but here's the tension. The tension is that we cannot wait until we have it all figured out to take steps. We can't, we can't just like sit idly by trying to fix ourselves all the time. Like we have to move on in life. Sometimes the shaking gets really bad and I'm embarrassed by it. And so I just make up excuses like I'm just really cold right now. Um, and like whatever, like I, I, but if I waited till I was comfortable sharing a message, I would never preach. I would never teach. I would never get up in front of people. If I waited till I was comfortable, I wouldn't do it. And frankly, Throughout my life and, and studying scripture, like I think God's given me some really good things to share. But if I just had to wait until I was like, whoo, I'm so excited. I got everything, all my ducks are in a row. I wouldn't preach and I wouldn't teach. And so we cannot wait till we have it all figured out to take next steps. And we cannot let our weaknesses and our vulnerabilities paralyze us from loving people like Jesus. And I, and I want to apologize early on in the message for high JPMs. That's Jesus is per minute. Um, it, you know, but Jesus never seemed to mind working with people who were still figuring stuff out. He never mind. It, it was like everyone he talked to, they were, they were always struggling. Jesus asked a bunch of people who were dropouts, sinners. They, they were struggling with things. They weren't liked. They were young. They were figuring things out. Jesus asked a bunch of those people, and through their following of him and learning of him and him sending them and helping them and teaching them and transforming their lives, they did incredible things, including launching the Christian church, which we all are, you know, benefit of today. So uh, huge stuff. Jesus didn't mind working with people who are still figuring it out. Recently, I, I wanted to start a community group. Bryant mentioned earlier that part of my job is, is managing some of the, the group stuff here at Centerpoint. And uh, we've noticed just people in kind of areas that are further away from this area, like 30, 45 minute drives they're coming in. Um, and we wanted to start one in Lakeland. Any, any Lakelanders in here? Woo! Yeah, they're in my small group. Um, yeah, yeah, Plant City? Yeah, Apollo Beach? No? Okay, well, there's some of you as well. I know, I know. Um, so we wanted to plant some of these things out, and we, we were just kind of like, you know, maybe we'll just do it. So my wife and I kind of thought through, we're like, okay, we'll just start a, we'll start a community group. We'll, you know, meet some people, have some good conversations, and hopefully we'll just inspire them uh, to host their own, you know, small groups next semester, or the semester after that, and just kind of like slowly build some in these areas the problem is that our house is terrible for hosting people. Like, it's not good. We have a single lane driveway, so parking is horrible. You can get like maybe three cars, other, and, you're, and then you're just in the grass. Uh, and then uh, on top of that, we have a small living room. Like, you can comfortably fit seven people-ish, maybe eight if you're squeezing. Um, you have to really like each other in our, in our, in our small group. Small, small living room, there's no great place for kids to play without being distracting. Like we have these paper thin doors like uh, many of you probably have experienced, except for the playroom is connected to the tiny living room. So like if they're in there, you hear everything. It's, it's just not a great place. Oh, did I mention there's holes in my floors? Did I mention that? Yeah, our subfloor, totally rotting. There's just, there's just floor, floor holes that you gotta dodge, okay? So I give them a map when they walk in. Um, that's not true. That's not true. I can joke about it, but in all honesty, like I was pretty nervous. Like I took a photo. Uh, this is what you see when you walk in my door. These are the patches that I've done where I've like fixed giant holes that you will fall through and, and we're continuously working on that. Uh, but you know, we were like, what if people see our house and think, man, they don't care. Like they weren't, they weren't prepared for us. They're like, got all these projects going on. There's construction stuff around. Or, or what if they judge us? Like, this is a tiny space. Like, this is not a good, I don't know why they thought that they could lead a small group. This is not a great space for it. But we did it anyways. We moved forward. We, we kind of just trusted God. Like, hey, this is, this is the thing that we're going to do. And on our second meeting, 
So not our first. The second time, we were kind of doing the typical things you do with small groups, chatting, giving floor hole updates, things like that. And, uh, and, and one of the couples, they said this cool thing, and I, I really appreciate it. They said, hey, we were talking on our drive home last week, and we just thought it was so nice that your house wasn't perfect. I was like, okay, hold on. <laughs> You know, but, but, they, but they said, I, I, just, I inquired further. Um, he said, hey, so often people have these pristine homes that feel so unrealistic and unattainable. Uh, in your home, your home made us feel like we could host a group, even though we just live in an apartment. I was like, okay. Like the whole, group, the whole goal of having a group in the first place was to do just that, to inspire people and, and, you know, to have some good conversations, meet some people, and inspire people to, to launch their own groups in the future. And the current leading factor right now of that is not my great communication skills. It's not my Bible knowledge. Like, I was excited about that. I love, you know, throwing in a Bible thing there. Turns out, like, half the people in my small group have biblical degrees and, like, worked at churches. So that's just mute. Uh, it, you know, it's not the delicious snacks. It's not my really cute dog that has two colored eyes. And, you know, it's none of that. The leading, the leading thing that's inspiring people to do the thing that I made the group for is the holes in my floor. That's it. It's the thing. It, it, you know, that, that is, but that's just it, right? Like, it's so often the stuff that we want to hide that connects us with people. It's, you know, it's coming to grips, you know, with your weaknesses. It's coming to grips with who you are, even on your worst days. That's just part of the human experience. It keeps us humble. It reminds us that we need each other. And there's just something so jarring about people that can't do that. People that can't, that aren't to the point. That's like their weakness is they can't admit that they have weaknesses, you know. It's like the job interview. So what are like some, some of your weaknesses? Well, I'm like, I'm like really early everywhere. Like I always get there super early. Like, like you know what I'm saying? Like, come on. But, you know, we, we know in our own life and in the Bible, man, the Bible is so cool. It's full of people that God uses that are just far from perfect. The Bible was written in this part of the world at a time. We call it the ancient Near East, uh, ancient being really old. Uh, and, and, and there's all these different cultures, and we have lots of written documents from them, whether it's on pottery or, uh, or just inscribed or little papyris. And, and they tell, like, war stories and all sorts of different things. Uh, and they always just share the victories. They just talk about how awesome they are. They're like, every battle, man, it was an overwhelming victory. We marched on them. They stood no chance. Our king is the best. We're so strong. Like, that's what they, but the Bible, the Bible takes a, a slightly different angle on this. Like, God is the one who's lifted up as this awesome being, but the people that he worked with, they just kind of sound like people. Like, the people in the Bible, uh, they're not that impressive. Uh, very often, you're like, I would not hang out with that person. I don't, like, Moses, I don't know if you know this, Moses uh, was known to stumble over his words, like, you probably, you, you probably know who Moses is. If not, he's the guy that God used to bring the Hebrews out of Egyptian slavery through the wilderness and to the promised land. Like, he's this huge figure he's talked about all the time. And he was a terrible spokesperson. That's one of the first things you learn about Moses. Uh, he, God's telling him what he's going to do in his life. And Moses says this. He says, hey, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you've spoken to me, uh, I'm slow of speech and tongue, which I know this is an English translation, but like, if you say the word eloquent, you're pretty good. Like, that's a good, that's a good word. But he, you know, he's like, I, I'm slow of speech and tongue. Like, I'm not, I'm not a great spokesperson. You're telling me to go talk to the Pharaoh, like the, like the leader of Egypt? And it's kind of funny, I, like a lot of people consider Moses to have written this part of the Bible. And, and I, I think it's just funny that no one stopped him and was like, hey, Moses, uh, you know when you told the creator of the universe that you have a bad mouth? Like, just don't add that. You can just skip that part. Skip to, like, the cool part where, like, the Red Sea parts, and let's just talk about the cool stuff. No, he's like, it's a weakness. Like, I'm not, I, I'm not the person. I'm not the guy. Don't pick me. And the obvious response, and I love this, God says, who gave human beings their mouths? 
Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and I will teach you what to say. In this moment where God just isn't concerned with Moses' limitations, he's more than enough to, to make up for Moses' slack. He's like, I'm fully aware of how communication works, Moses. Like, I did the thing. Like, I know how it works. Just trust me. I'll be with you. And this launches Moses' ministry. Like, this is a thing that is a staple of who he is through all of the different trials and struggles and human relationships and difficulties of leadership. He just knows that God's with him, and he constantly returns and, and, and has questions and has conversations. And, and, and he actually has this cool moment where he's struggling, leading them a little bit, and they're, they're, not, they're not being the best uh, followers. Um, and he's like, hey, God, listen, this is super difficult. Um, if you're not going to come with us, I'm just going to sit here with you. Like, I'm not going forward. If you're not going, I'm not going. Like, Moses becomes so reliant on, on who God is. His confidence to do the thing that God called him to is solely in the person who called him to do the thing. It's not in his own strength. It's not in his own abilities. It's not how good of a, a speaker he is, or how great of a leader he is. It's actually in his weakness that God shines, and there's so many examples like this, like David, King David, little, little King David, uh, before the king part. Yeah, he, he goes up to face this giant named Goliath. And it, like that story is not impressive. It was just like two strong dudes fighting each other. You know what I'm talking about? Like it's, what makes it so unique, what makes it so interesting uh, is precisely that David was not prepared for that battle. He was a kid. No one would pick him. No, they, in fact, in the story, it recounts a bunch of people saying, bro, don't do it. Like, you will lose this fight. You can't, you can't even fit in armor. Like, you're going, in, you're going wearing a shirt. What are you doing? You're not going to be able to do this. He's got a spear. He's massive. Like, you're not going to make it. And then he drops this, like, bombshell of a lion. It's so cool. It says, Yahweh who rescued me from the hand of the lion and from the hand of the bear, he will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. David's stature was not an obstacle for God. And David knew it. Like, and here, here's the question. When we're reflecting on all this stuff, it's like, what about you have you decided isn't usable by God? What about you? Have you decided, eh, God couldn't use that? I mean, that's like a really big weakness. Like, I, I would never pick someone like me. What about you? Have you decided isn't usable by God? In the New Testament, Paul, he's going back and forth with this really frustrating church in Corinth. There's a whole bunch of issues there. Read First and Second Corinthians, great stuff. Um, but he's 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 struggling back and forth. And one of the things that he struggles with. Uh, is that they were starting to question his authority as a leader and as an apostle. Kind of for several different reasons, but the, the, the big thing is like he just wasn't very externally impressive. He was poor. He was often homeless. He worked a, a manual labor job. He didn't have a lot of money. He was often just suffering or he was in jail in and out of that. Like he was, he was not that. And it turns out he wasn't a very impressive speaker either because he joins Moses in that. Like there's other people that just spoke better than him that were more put together. They had nicer clothes. They looked, they looked the part better. They spoke really eloquently. You know, they, they were just more impressive. And so they were like, I think like maybe, maybe this Paul guy, like things don't seem to be lining up. He keeps, he keeps suffering. So I don't know if God's with him. And he, he kind of, you know, he makes this long argument. He goes on a rant. And by the way, Paul, that dude can rant. So you should, you should check it out. Uh, uh, he says this. He says, if it's necessary to boast. He's like, you want me to boast? I'll boast. Okay. You want me to make myself sound impressive? Okay, here we go. If it's necessary for me to boast, I will boast about the things related to my weakness. And then he does. In this satirical way, he shows that through his suffering and through his embarrassment and through all these trials, God has built a resume for Paul that is way more impressive than any of these other guys. And it's through his weaknesses. He, he gets to the end, he says this, therefore, rather, I will boast most gladly in my weakness in order that the power of Christ may reside in me. Therefore, I delight in my weakness, in the insults, in calamities, in persecutions, difficulties for the sake of Christ. Whenever I am weak, then I am strong. 
It's like, this whole thing, it's so impressive. It's the thing that is so cool about me is that God is using me, even though I am not the guy that you would choose. Uh, Bryant, super good looking dude. He, it's like, he's a great pastor. He's a great front man. He cuts his hair every other day to keep it that perfect length. Like that's, you know, we would, we would all feel weird if Paul was our, was our pastor. Like, you think about all the beatings he took, the shipwrecks, the starvation. Like, he was probably scars everywhere. He was probably a little, like, just weak looking. Uh, You know, we would never, and that's the stuff that Paul's like, look what God has done in my life. And he uses this person, this guy Paul, to plant church after church after church, including in Corinth. Uh, He's like, hey, you're actually my, like, letter of recommendation. Like, I I planted you guys. Like, God's doing incredible stuff, and he just owns it. He's like, I'll boast about my weaknesses because it just shows you how powerful my God is. So together, I just want to ask a few questions. I want to give a few tips. I I hope that we can just reflect on this together. Um, But the first thing is just to own own your weakness. Just just own it. When When I was a teenager, really a kid all the way up, I was hyper competitive. I don't know if any of you guys can relate to this. I had to win at everything. I had to be the fastest. I had to be the strongest. I had to be the smartest. I had to be the funniest. I don't even know how you change this, but I had to be the best looking. Like, I, I had to win at everything. And it was a real problem. But the thing is, I just didn't even realize it. I didn't even see it as a problem. And uh, until one day, I was hanging out with a group of my friends and they were playing a, a video game on a, on a TV and, and this girl who's dating like my best friend at the time, she goes, you know, hey, don't tell John your score or we're going to be here for a while until he beats it. I was like, oh, am I really going to say that in front of everybody? She was probably correct though, is the, is the, is the truth. You know, it was like a little comment, but that thing stuck with me. I thought that I was being cool. Like, I thought being the best at all these things was, like, making me uh, just like, oh, wow, look how cool John is. John's awesome. He's so good at all these things. Really, what I was communicating is that I thought I was better than everybody else. And it was, it was killing my relationships. It was killing my influence. And this moment was a pivotal thing for me where I, you know, changed the direction a little bit of how I interacted with people and how I saw games and competitions and I started lifting other people up and started to really work on this thing in my life. And, and I just ask you the question, what's killing your relationships and your influence in people's lives? Is there a weakness in your life that you're like, you're getting d- destroyed by and maybe you don't even know it? Reflect on it. Own your weaknesses. If, you, you know, if you're going to love people like Jesus, this question has to matter to us. It has to, whether it's communication skills that we got to work on, selfishness, pride, whatever is on the top of your list, like this stuff. If there's a glaring weakness, whether it's your fault or not, you kind of have two options. One, you can just ignore it. I did that for a long time. You can just ignore it, pretend it doesn't exist, hide it. You know, it's their problem. It's not my problem. Or two, you can own it and you can do something about it. And then you can let God's redemptive power use it in your life for good. And I don't know which one you're at, but I know for me, it's like it always turns out better when I just own my weakness. And, and it might hurt. Think about Paul. Like this guy had to do a 180 from literally persecuting and killing Christians to like admitting everything he was doing was wrong, going through this growth journey. And then eventually he launches the movement to the Gentiles. He's planning church after church and he does incredible things. But he first had to own his weakness. He had to own what he was doing. And nowadays... In my own life, I see selfishness, and I see competitiveness, and I see pride. Like, I see it so clearly. And through the years, I, I'd, I'd worked with student ministry for 13 years, and I, the amount of young, young men that I spoke with, and I've just spotted it, it's like a highlight, because I saw it in myself, and I see it in them, and I've been a little bit more tactful than she was. I don't just, like, publicly shame them. But I'll pull them aside and be like, hey, like, I see this in your life, and I, I know that you might be thinking this, but it's, it's actually like, it's making people not like you. And that's not what I want for you. And that's not what you want for you. That's not what God wants for you. Can I come alongside you and help you work through this? 
And I, God's, God's used me in so many people's lives because of my own suffering, my own weakness, my own foolishness. The second thing is embrace being vulnerable. We all have ideals about who we want to be. For me, it's like I want to be calm, collected, ready in any sort of situation. You know, I want to be this like smart, like, like, like a wise guru that people come to and like, yes, I do have advice for you. Like, that's who I want to be. Um, I, I'm not like a highly emotional person. Uh, and, and, and kind of in a negative way, it just manifested in my life where I don't really like crying in public. Like, it was just a thing. My wife makes fun of me all the time. She's like, I've never seen you cry. I'm like, I do. I just wait for you to fall asleep. Um, <laughs> Like, like, it's fine, when, and I, I even appreciate when others do it. Like, Bryant gets hyper all the time. He gets real emotional. He's, he's like, in the moment, he feels it so deeply, and he's like, the, then he pauses, and we all feel it, and we're like, oh, Bryant, and we're like, yes, and it speaks, and we connect with it, but for some reason, I just feel so awkward about it. And I'm like, why can't I just be vulnerable? Why can't I just be honest with my emotions and what I'm feeling, and and one day, we were at a, at a middle school retreat. I was, I was leading a, a group of 125 or so middle schoolers. We're a larger church, and so we invited some other churches to join us that didn't have the resources that we did. Like, hey, join us. You're going to have a great experience. And that, that was true uh, all the way until the, the very last night. We had invited uh, this, this small inner city church, kind of a different demographic than us. Uh, and I found out the next morning that on the final night, some of our middle school boys just started like yelling racial slurs at this group of, this group of people. Uh, and they even wrote some really nasty stuff and they posted it on their like cabin door. Yeah. And you know, I found out the next morning because they weren't at chapel. That church didn't come to chapel. They went to the lake to kind of debrief. Uh, and I was like, wait, what happened? Are you serious? Like, I was broken. I, I was just like, are you, like, for one, it was just so horrible. And then two, it was like, wait, people that are, like, I'm over, I'm in charge of, like, they did that? There's that kind of, like, evil in their hearts? Like, what's going on? And it broke me, and I, and I, I didn't know how to address it. Um, I spoke with some of the other leaders, and I, I don't know, I, I, I was, like, trying to come up with some sort of message to communicate through it, just to acknowledge it. I kind of just scrapped whatever we were going to teach. And I, and I got up, and I, and I sat on the, the stairs in front of the stage, and I tried to, like, say something about it, like, just acknowledge it. And I got, like, two to three sentences in, and I broke. I just, tears, it was no, there was no cute Bryant crying. It was full on. <laughs> it was just, like, I couldn't say a word. I tried for, like, 20 seconds, and it just wasn't happening. And I'm sitting there thinking like, oh, no, I'm at a middle school camp. I'm never going to live this down. <laughs> I mean, like weeks later, they, hey, John, you remember that time you cried in front of everybody? Like whatever, like that was what's happening in my head. And then I look up and there's like all these middle schoolers that just join me. They just, they sit around me, they put their arm on me and they just grieved. And they just cried and we just had this moment of like, we just witnessed something together that was awful. And we're just going to acknowledge it. We're going to let God do something here. And, and gosh, it was probably one of my best sermons. And I think I spoke six sentences. Because it just went deeper than words. And so when you embrace vulnerability, this sorts of thing, like God uses these moments. God uses these moments to communicate something beyond what you think you're able to communicate. And sometimes it's not a big moment. Sometimes it's a smaller thing. Like, I, I always think about this one uh, small group leader we had who she was incredible. She was awesome. She was always texting her, her group and, hey, you know, hey, can't wait to see you this morning. You guys want me to bring donuts, whatever. And they just weren't very responsive. Like, maybe one person would be like, sure, chocolate. Um, and so she was kind of getting offended and getting hurt. And so she, she just texted the group and she goes, hey, y'all. I know this is probably my own insecurity, but when no one replies, it makes me feel sad. It makes me feel like you don't care about me. 
And uh, I, don't, I don't know if that's true or not. But, and, and what it did is it launched, this one little text launched, it's like multiple weeks of just incredible growth for that small group. Like, oh my gosh, no way, you are an incredible leader. We love you. That's on us. Like, so sorry we communicated that. And it like reshaped this whole thing uh, in this overly positive way. There's just a little bit of clear communication, a little bit of vulnerability. So the question for you, what steps towards vulnerability do you need to take to better your relationships and move towards authenticity? And I'm, saying, I'm not saying like turn into an oversharer and like make people feel uncomfortable. We know who those people are, don't point. But like, I'm not saying that there's a reasonableness to this, but there is, there is a step. There is something going on in your life. I know that you're like, okay, yeah, I've been hiding that. I haven't been as honest as I want to be to myself and to my, my friends. Like, I, I need to take a step forward and do something. And, you know, sometimes it's things that surprise us. There's addiction issues. There's medical diagnosis that, you know, sometimes it's not even your fault. But, gosh, it is so healing to discuss this stuff with other people. It's so healing to discuss this stuff with other people and know that you're not alone. Like I've seen it time and time again when people just embrace a little vulnerability when they own their weakness. God does incredible things in their lives, in the lives of those that they're interacting with. Finally, I just say progress at your own pace, for sure, but, but progress. Getting real with your weaknesses and your vulnerabilities, that's scary. And trusting someone like Jesus to use those things, that's even scarier. Jesus, you know, he says multiple times, like, I want you to have a life. It's that John 10, 10, abundant life. I want you to have incredible life. I want you to have good things. Uh, we talk about all the time, like, God just, God wants good things for you. He's like, I created joy. I want those things for you. And here's the thing, you know, so often we're like, I, I don't know. I'm not ready. I'm not there yet. You just disqualify yourself before even taking a step. But I'm confident, I'm so confident that Jesus can use you at your worst. You don't have to wait. Jesus didn't pick 12 like incredible uh, leaders who were just nothing wrong with them. They had amazing resumes. They were perfect. They were successful. They were wealthy. No, Jesus picked a bunch of people who were fishermen. He picked a tax collector, people that were like publicly known as sinners, a bunch of average at best people. And he used them to change the world. Like to put this into like a basketball metaphor or something, like Jesus was like, hey, give me any five people. Give me any five people. And I'm so confident in my own leadership and ability to transform people that you can bring any star team you want and we will win. He's like, it doesn't matter. It's not, it's not on you. Jesus can use you at your worst. As the truth is, you're never going to have it all together. That's, that's encouragement right there, right at the end here. You're never going to have it all together. You will never be smart enough for you fill in the blank. You're never, you're never going to be prepared enough for you're never going to be perfect. That's just the reality. Jesus isn't asking you to be perfect. He's asking you to trust him. He's asking you to trust him, not just with the impressive parts about you, but the parts that you're, you're tempted to hide, to, sh to, to, to hold back. He's like, just, just lay it all out. I'm with you. I will give you the words to say. I will be with you. I will show you where to go. Sometimes you have a, a glaring weakness. Sometimes you've got a hole in the floor. And you just, you just got to take a step. You got to dodge the hole, but you got to take a step. Let's pray. God, thank you for this incredible group of people. They're so talented. Uh, I'm just so thankful for this church and this community and all the people's experiences and lives that I get, to, I get to learn from and grow from. But I also know that we're not perfect and there's a lot of stuff in our lives that we maybe are a little embarrassed about or we, we hold back, we hide. And I just pray as a group today that we would take a step forward. We would own our weaknesses. We'd embrace our vulnerabilities 
and we would move forward, we would take a step, we would trust you, God, to, to do something incredible in our lives. And I know as a God who is over all things that you can. So I just pray a blessing over the people here and thank you for always being with us, even in our worst, worst moments. We love you and we thank you. Here we pray, amen. Thank you.